that will sit in your name. 2022. Wow. It's amazing. I'm going to share this morning a few rumors. Now, please bear with me. <laughs> these, these rumors are rumors about good stuff. There's some uh, rumors floating around from uh, different sources. Some are prophetic voices, so you can't consider those to be rumors. Because if it's a prophetic voice, then it's something that God is telling the prophetic voices to tell us. So we can take more confidence in something that comes from that. But there's also some other things that, that involve uh, patriotism. People that just love this country, that are, that are proud to stand and salute the flag, you know, and very patriotic and, and believe in our, uh, our uh, one nation under God principle, you know. And there's a lot of people like that, a whole lot of people. And there are some people in high levels of a position in very few in our government, but a lot of them in our military. And I understand why, because our military really does promote patriotism. And it teaches us about the flag and about our country and, uh, you know, and all that. So I can understand that there's a lot there. And, and there's some word floating around through the Internet mostly that uh, patriots have been working behind the scenes uh, to do some very good things that's going to promote our nation where it'll give us a, a stability in financial realms and in, in, in law and order and, and really every aspect of our society. And I'm hopeful that it's actually happening because I don't know for sure if it's happening, but that there's a, a big shift moving away from what the leftist liberal theology has instituted in our school systems and in the financial and everything. They infiltrated everything. And they took it in a way that was absolutely opposite of what God had established. Everything that God says is wrong and bad, they're taking it and promoting it like it's the right thing. They, they are taking lies and saying that they're true, and they're not. There's, there's teachings in, uh, in our schools and in our colleges that is pulling them away from the things of God and more to a humanistic type of situation, you know. So we know that's the work of the devil, that he's doing that. But there are some indications that it's turning around. So praise God. We're going to be able to get back to what really this country was really all about. This country was founded... Not because some people got together and said, oh, let's just put our country together. No, it was founded because of God. There are only two nations that were established by the hand of God. Israel is one of them, right? And the other one is the United States of America. Our founding fathers uh, honored God with everything that they put together for our Constitution, the Declaration of Independence. All of that was uh, from guidance from our Father, from the Word of God and establish something that was good. And you notice that America throughout the years has been very good to this world, has established a lot of freedom for so many countries. Many uh, soldiers, you know, airmen, sailors, you know, uh, Coast Guard, all, so many service members have given their lives to allow other countries to benefit from the freedoms that we have, you know. We could have stood here and been free, but no, God used America to kind of stabilize the world. Because if the you know, United States wasn't there, I know we made mistakes along the way, but if, if overall, if the United States was not there to provide that kind of stability, this world would have already gone in the opposite direction. We'd already be having to for, uh, face a situation of Sodom and Gomorrah or a big flood again. It could have got that bad. But because of Christians living in this nation, establishing uh, righteousness and truth, even though it may be on a small scale, it was enough <laughs> to keep this world stable. So I'm very grateful for that. And I'm looking forward to hopefully some of these rumors coming true. Let me, let me share a couple of things. Uh, Social Security. You know, that's, that gets your attention right there. Huh? Social Security is, is something that we have paid into for years. I remember when I first started working, I think I was 13 years old, and I would get my check, 
I was a busboy at the end. I'd get my check, and they said S S N right there, and they took some money from me. You know, I said, "Oh my, what is that about?" You know, I, I didn't understand back then. And then they would take out a little bit of tax, and what's the other one, S S I or something for Medicaid or something, or they're taking all that money out. You know, and then uh, you know, years down the road, I started to understand that's a retirement account for us. You know, so I thought that was a pretty good deal after a while. Especially since next month I'm going to apply for Social Security, so, <laughs> so I'm, I'm kind of excited about that. But listen to this. Okay, this is still rumor. You can research this for yourself. But there is a plan to take what the enemy has stolen, and I guarantee you our Social Security money has been stolen. <laughs> it has been misappropriated. And you can look at the books and the records how Congress has stole money out of Social Security you know, and use it on their projects, you know. So the rumor is that all of that that has been stolen is going to be put back in its proper place. And when it is put back in the proper place, some people are saying, some financial folks are saying that Social Security, the minimum is going to be $5,000 a month. Wow. Is that a nice rumor? <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard to believe, isn't it? But it's a rumor, okay? That's just a rumor. I'm making it very clear. But I think there's some good evidence to back that up. So I'm hopeful that that's going to happen. And then you think about the Bible, right? Everything that the enemy has stolen for us, from us, God says he has to return it back seven times over. So think about that. What if our Social Security money got stolen? What if the taxes we paid in got stolen? You know, And the enemy has to return that. So it could be, because this is the other rumor, and this uh, this got a little more credibility because some pro prophetic voices are backing this up, is that we are facing, as a world population, a year of jubilee. Now, now not, I know we don't quite grab a hold of jubilee because it's not part of our culture, but the Jewish people absolutely know what a jubilee is. Every seven years, they would go through this cycle and they buy and sell and trade and you know, live life the way we do normally, you know. But every seventh year, all the debts were forgiven. Can you imagine that? All the debts forgiven. Do you owe anybody any money? Yeah. Wouldn't it be nice? Wow. That thing got forgiven. That's another rumor. I'm making it clear. It's a rumor that the debts are about to be forgiven. Because of this, they're saying that Every loan that we've ever had, you know, like car loan, uh, school loans, house loans, that the money and the interest that they were charging us was an illegal de deal. They were manipulating the whole system, and they were robbing us. And if you've ever bought a house, you understand what I'm talking about. Isn't it, isn't it terrible? You buy a house, right? Like we, we bought our house, I think, and it was uh, refinanced, and we had an $80,000 loan on it. So my payment, our payment was like, I don't know, $700. And when you look at the breakdown, out of that $700, only about $75 was going to the principal. That $75 was coming off of the loan amount, whereas all the rest was interest. How how we... How we do that, I don't understand how we do it or allow it, but the forces that are in control right now are saying that that was uh, theft, outright theft. And they say it's going to be returned to us. So, I mean, there's some things to hope for in this near future. There's some good things that could very well happen. And, uh, and with God in control and moving things the way he's moving things right now, I, I believe that we're looking forward to some very good days. Uh, one prophetic voice said that he saw he saw this vision. God told him to write this down, and he told him that America's better days are still ahead. I mean, we can look back. America has been blessed more than any other country. We have lived very, very good. We're about the only country that has a middle class. You know, everybody else is either rich or poor, kind of thing. But we, we all get to live good here in America. you know. And he says it's going to be better than that. That the Lord showed him it's going to be better. So we have a lot of good things to look forward to. 
and we we are called to establish this new uh, righteousness that God is moving on the land. We get to partake in that. So uh, I hope that this message today will help us to encourage us to take our stand for righteousness and truth so that as we face, there'll be challenges, as we face the challenges in the future that we're going to overcome them just like we did in 2021. Praise God. If you have your Bibles with you today, turn with me to Exodus chapter 17 and verse 8. I like to share this uh, this sermon at the start of the year because it gives so much hope and encouragement. Exodus chapter 17, verse 8. Now here we have uh, Moses and Joshua and all them guys. They're, you know, they're headed towards the promised land. They're about to take the promised land here. It's something that God has promised them. He's promised them a land flowing with milk and honey. Uh, and they're, they're feeling pretty good. The rumors of their day are saying, hey, man, it's great over there. When we get over to the other side, life is going to be good. And kind of like we're facing right now, yeah. And so uh, he's, he's talking about that. And, and so they're, they're facing an army. They're confronted with an army. And it's a big challenge. Big, big challenge. So uh, Moses tells Joshua, okay, get our forces together. Let's, let's go head on with this. And I'm going to sit up here on top of the mountain. I'm going to do my thing. You guys go in there. You do your thing. And God will be for us. So that's kind of what we're seeing here. Now Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, Choose us some men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses and Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And so it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. When he laid down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands became heavy. So they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called its name, The Lord is my banner. Wow. This is amazing here. Here the people of God, with all the promises that God has given them, are facing a major challenge. I mean, they're, this Amalek is strong enough to beat them. You can see clearly here, because when Moses' hands were down, Amalek started to prevail, started to win. So without the, without the support from God, Amalek could have easily overtaken Israel. But they had God on their side. And see, Moses here, as he's uh, holding the rod of God, it's kind of like the rod that holds up our, our flags, because a, a flag is considered a banner. And so he was holding up that banner, and all the people of Israel knew exactly what that meant. That was the rod of God. That's the rod that, that God had given to Moses. And remember, he took that rod and laid it down, and it turned into a snake. With, remember when he's confronting Pharaoh? That's the rod. So they knew that it represented the power of God. So when Moses was holding it up, man, they, they felt courage. They felt strength. And you could tell the difference because they were, they were forceful and they were beating the enemy back when they knew that God was with them because that banner was held up real high. But when they saw Moses get a little bit tired and the banner kind of dropped down to here, they thought, oh, no, the banner's coming down, you know. We're, we're, we're losing God's favor kind of thing and, and they got a little bit afraid and, and now they weren't fighting as well as they were before. You know, they thought that maybe, maybe Elmlick is too tough for us, you know. But then, uh, who was it with the most, uh, Aaron and Hurt? They got an idea, they put a, a rock under there and, and Moses sat on the rock and each guy got on that rod and Moses got his arm stretched out and they're holding that thing up and now it's steady. That banner is solid now. 
and it carried them throughout the day until they received the victory. Praise God. That banner is important. Yeah, that banner is very, very important. We've seen the movies on TV where, you know, that U.S. flag, you know, right in the middle of battle. And there's that one show where they, they show that one guy that he picks up that flag and, and he, he moves forward with it because the army's trying to retreat, but he grabs that flag and as soon as the banner is lifted up, the courage of the men to turn around and engage in the fight comes forward, you know. And uh, so the banner is important. It is important for us, you know. It gives us a, a courage and strength uh, to do things that we think that we can't do. It helps us to move into situations and overcome situations that we thought we could not handle. You know? So the banner is important. And we have a greater banner than any flag of any nation. We have a greater banner than that, that rod that, that Moses had. This is what we have. This is our banner. This is our purpose. We have this available to us all the time. So this is what keeps us and strengthens us and helps us to overcome all the conflicts and the, the things of this world. It said, I put a definition here of, of a banner, of a standard. A standard is, a, is the same word for banner. It says, something established for use as a rule. See, this is what God has given us. And when we were first established of a nation, we followed this pretty close. Wasn't perfect, but we followed this pretty close. Way closer than any other country ever had before. Because even Israel, they rejected this. Remember? When Je half of it anyway, New Testament. They killed Jesus. They didn't, they didn't follow Christianity. Matter of fact, the Jewish people still, you know, in, in Hebrew, they follow the, the Old Covenant, you know. That's still their religion. They want to build another temple. They still want to do that. They want to sacrifice animals. They still want to do all that. But not in America. America, we establish our future based on this standard right here. And so long as we pretty much followed it, America has been blessed. And America will continue, continue to be blessed so long as we hold this banner up high. And that's where we come in. We are the bearers of this standard right here. We're the ones that go out into our communities and school and work and uh, uh, restaurants and different places. And when we come in, we are the standard bearers. This is the standard that God has ordained. Now, we're not very popular because the rest of the world, they want to do their own thing. They want to follow some other standard, you know. They want to do whatever they feel is right for them. And in a, in a free society, well, they can. So there's a big challenge there. But without us, there is no stability. The Bible says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. We carry the knowledge. Our world will, would fall apart fast if it wasn't for us, the standard, standard barriers of God. If we were not in society, society could not exist. And now, I believe 2022, God is calling us to move forward with our standard and bear this standard more uh, aggressively into this uh, year of 2022. Because uh, the opportunity for people to receive salvation is, is, is gaining uh, ground big time. We don't hear a lot of stories about this, but there is a, an evangelist, uh, and he's going, he was in California for a while there, went through a bunch of cities, and then recently he's been in, uh, in uh, New York City, uh, Mario Murillo. I don't know if you've ever heard of him, uh, but he's, he's a good guy, real simple guy too, you know. And he's not a real, you know, real uh, uh, well-known preacher and... He's not like educated in the in the religious things. So you see this guy, he's a regular guy. He's not a religious person, you know. And the results that they are seeing as they take the banner to, the, to these big cities, people are getting saved left and right. It is happening. People are running forward. And he, he's putting up these huge tents. And people see the tent, what's going on. They go look and see and they, 
they 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 feel the presence of God in their midst, and they see the standard bearers, <laughs> all these Christians in there that are bearing the standard of righteousness and truth, and it cups cuts deep into their hearts to convict them of their sin, and many are responding to the altar calls. They were uh, they had this one one lady, and she couldn't move. She was just like in a wheelchair. She couldn't hardly move or anything. And they brought her forward and, and they prayed for her and and she got healed completely. Right there in front of everybody, she was totally healed. And the, the preacher said, he said, uh, I couldn't do anything else but make an altar call because everybody was 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 crying and and they were they were convicted and they saw God's hand move and they were compelled. So I gave the altar call. He says almost the whole tent moved forward to receive salvation. So we're in that time. We're in the time where the standard bearers are very necessary. We we are those standard bearers. So as often as we can, we need to present that to this lost and dying world. Uh, what I thought was always a good tool for us to bear the standard is going to a restaurant. We have made this a, a commitment for a couple of reasons. That every time we go to a restaurant and we sit down to eat, before we eat our meal, we're going to pray right there in public. And I'm going to pray out loud. you know. So we sit and we pray and we thank God for our food and all that because, uh, number one, that's bearing the standard. That's holding the standard up high. People know exactly that I'm not... I'm not praying to Muhammad or nothing like that, you know. I'm not just saying a, a generic uh, prayer. I'm thanking God in the name of Jesus Christ, my Lord, for what he's given us to eat. And I'm asking for his blessings on him. So that's one way that we can use that, you know. Because other people notice that. How many people do you notice praying at the restaurant? It don't happen that often, huh? No, it don't. But we can, see. That's a good tool for us. Just say a prayer and eat your meal, and you, you've influenced almost the whole restaurant right there by saying that prayer. You know? And then the other part is, too, you don't know what them cooks are doing back there, so <laughs> you better bless that meal <laughs> because you don't know what's going on back there. I worked in restaurants, and those of you that work in restaurants, you know sometimes things get out of hand back there. I might have dropped a steak or two on the floor before and still sold it out there. <laughs> So there's a couple reasons there. So we need to bear that standard as often as we can. We gotta let people know why. Why are you the way you are? Why why do you why do you go to church, you know? Why do you why do you carry your Bible? How come you read the Bible so much, you know? We have to be prepared to raise that standard up and say, because of Jesus. He made the whole difference. I'm gonna bear his Standard. I'm going to raise that flag. I'm not going to be ashamed of Jesus living in and through me. I'm proud of that fact, you know. So we need to bear our standards like that. Praise God. Uh, John chapter 21, verse 15. John chapter 21, verse 15. Uh, this is uh, the Apostle Peter. Let me read it here. Verse 15. And this is, a, this is a bit of a challenge, and I'm trying to challenge you this morning. I'm trying to challenge myself, too, because <laughs> I, I, I need it. I know you think that, wow, well, the preacher, he's got it all to get. No, I, I face some challenges, you know. Uh, there are some, uh, some things that, I, that are impressed upon me. I don't know if it's just me sometimes. Is the Lord impressing this on me? And... and I feel like a little bit pushed to do some things in life to promote, to promote the kingdom of God, you know. And so I kind of, as I evaluate those situations, where am I going to go with this, you know. We were talking the other day with somebody, and they were talking about, uh, we were talking about the program, you know. Remember those, man, those were good old days. We had a house full of disciples, and their families would come to church, you know. And then we ran the, the thing 24-7. It was an amazing time in our lives, you know, and uh, and we were kind of excited telling the story, you know, and and then this this guy that wasn't involved in that said, hey, so what would it take to get that thing going again? And I had to, 
I have to say, honestly, this is my heart at that point. I said, it would take someone that has their heart in it. I said, my heart's not in that right now. And, you know, that's, that's hard for me to say. But I, I just not, it's, I'm not there. Is God going to push me to something like that? I don't know. I know that this one preacher said one time, uh, he was talking to a fellow from his church. He said, man, I don't know. I don't want to get too into this because then God, you know, he might, he might cause me to uh, maybe want to go be a, uh, to go be a missionary in Africa, and I don't I don't want to go to Africa, so you know I, I'm scared. So I stay back a little bit. I hold back a little bit, and the preacher looks at him and tells him, "Well, don't worry about it. He won't send you to Africa." And the guy says, "Well, why wouldn't he?" He says, "Because you don't want to go. <laughs> What's he gonna send you to Africa if you don't want to be there? You're not gonna be no good over there, you know. <laughs> so he's not gonna send you somewhere you don't want to go." So we have to be listening to the Father's heart, and then when we connect with Him and we have that willingness, then He'll send us. Remember, He's going to grant us the desires of our hearts. He's not going to force us into something that we're not ready to do or that we don't want to do. Whatever you need to do, you're going to want to do it, and God's going to back you up and give you the strength and courage to do that very thing for you. So don't worry about... You know, he's not going to go way out there and say, oh, I'm going to send you over there. Even though you don't want to go, you're going to go. No, that's the military. <laughs> yeah. But that God doesn't work that way. But he does challenge us. And I feel that challenge from time to time still. And listen to Peter's challenge here. Oh, my goodness. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Simon was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish to go. This he spoke signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. You know, we think of Peter, we even call him St. Peter sometimes, right? We think of him a mighty man of, of God and, you know, a leader uh, and ruled the people well in his day and time and all that. And, and here he is, you know, he's being challenged by God to move in a certain direction. And Jesus confronts him, kind of breaks him down a little bit, huh? Kind of humbles him right here in front of everybody else. I mean, he, he, this is the guy he said, upon this rock I'll build my church. And he was talking to Peter, you know. And here he's being humbled and recognizing what God is asking him to do. You know? And he's asking us the same thing, you know. He wants us to live for him. Where else are we going to go? It's kind of like what Peter was saying. There's, there's no place else to go. I'm, I'm totally in this. I don't have a family or home to go back to. I don't have a business. My church uh, kicked me out. There's no place. Else. This is it. Where else do we have to go? There's no other religion that we can go to, right? We're committed to this, you know. So we might as well put our full effort into this. And God will be with us every step of the way. Okay? He wants us to raise that banner up high so that others can see. And there are plenty others that need Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we love you so much. We thank you for your goodness and your grace, Lord God. And, and Father, we know and understand that your banner of righteousness has been planted within us. You have given us the power and the strength and the love of the Holy Spirit to live within us. So, Father, help us to reflect your goodness and your grace, your grace to this lost and dying world. And, Father, we are, we are committed to your way. We know that there's no place to go. There, there's no chance of backsliding, going to our former life, because it doesn't even exist. You wiped out that former life, and we, there's nothing to go back to, Father. So we are here, and we are committed to your way. Father, give us the strength, 
the courage and the determination to fulfill the purpose and the plan that you have for our lives. Help us not to compromise in any way, Father God. And if we do, let us know the error of our way so that we can repent. We want to be quick to repent so that we can make things right with you. We don't want to miss your way. We see the example of Peter here. He didn't want to miss your way. He was totally committed to your way, Father God. We want to follow that example. We love you so much, Father. And we look forward to better days because we know 2022, there are many promises from your uh, prophets that are about to come forward, Father. And we will receive them and give you glory and honor and praise, Father God, because you know, we know you're such a good Father. And Father, we want to do our part. We're committed to do our part. So as you open doors for us, Father God, for service in our communities, for serving our fellow man, whatever it might be, Father, any opportunity that we have to do something good, you can count on us, Father, because we're committed to your way. We do love you. We love you with our whole lives, Father, and we'll, we are committed to you. Thank you, Father, for choosing us. We love you so much. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody say it. Amen. Amen. We are dismissed. Thank you, Jesus.